Um, and so, um, and then also with this, the, what is critical, as you can see, is the sense of display and how that display, display would work with that concept. So, and I was lucky enough to be able to put the work on the steps of the parliament, so that brought another dynamic, potential dynamic to the work, because in a sense, the steps of the parliament are, it's where all the petitions to parliament and all the press conferences take place, and it's a real point of communication between the inside and the outside. And so <clears throat> not only did I go into Parliament and have opportunity to document certain aspects within the Parliament, I actually got the chance to hang around on the steps and take photographs. So um, I'll just I'll lead you on um, through. Um, so it's... The, um, the shape, it was a bit of a battle to kind of work out how to present the work. And I, um, I arrived on this idea, the arc, because basically the Australian Parliament developed, um, you know, the British Parliament is, ba the Australian Parliament is based on the British Parliament, which is, um, has an arrangement where there's two swords go down, and it's quite adversarial, that sort of setup. Whereas in Australia, they have brought in the sort of curve at the end of the parliament, which is more collegiate. So I was drawing on that idea as um, trying to bring the, the um, outs, um, inside out and also the outside in. Um, so um, just to start with this, um, one of my, the, my work often expands from the idea of the autobiographical. So I really start at that starting point and I want to create various narratives, try to explore the narratives of Parliament in relation to my own life. And um, by doing that, I've, I used a mixture of personal imagery with text messages from various um, friends and um, family within my life and how... and. Exploring the idea that, in a sense, our lives, all the, even these random text messages are implicitly have um, a political content. So, but I, in, I'm mindful in terms of not to sort of... Um, it was kind of a tricky line to, to draw because you have to be careful not in any way to sort of... Um, uh, to sort of draw out those parallels but not obviously be offensive, like you can't um, uh, work... So, so it's say like this one here, which is, I can see, um, I don't know if you can read the text on the, can you read the text on the screen? But um, one is a text from my daughter asking her, me to sign her out of school and um, saying, oh, you know, like, I don't mind if you don't, but I really prefer if you could sign me out of school. And it's sort of like, and then it's pitted against, you know, various bits of um, text from the legislation telling you, you know, like you can't, um, in terms of vag vagrancy and not going to school. So all these kind of beautiful things, this personal, and the, these texts were often taking place while I was in, you know, doing the project, and it's sort of these inter sort of interesting sort of juxtaposi juxtapositions between the personal and the political. Um, if I may, Eliza. Am I just, should I run through, because I'm going to, do you want me to speed through? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I, I was just going to add what I really like about your work and your, your project here is it really reflects how we, first of all, how we all consume politics and news yeah. stories nowadays. Uh, once upon a time, we were probably all sat at the TV and we broadcast out, mm. you know, into our homes yeah. and we could be consuming that. Nowadays, we consume it in the same breath as we, as we do our, our family conversations, our you know, mm. our gossip with our friends, yeah. um, our Googling for facts about what may be popping up on the news at the same time. Yeah. And this barrage of information mm. kind of hits us all at once, mm. often on one screen. Yeah. And that's what you so eloquently um, have communicated in this project, both breaking down how we consume media, but also by having this privileged position of being both on the floor of parliament in the Hansard suite, that's normally the control center for what gets broadcast yeah. out, as well as on the steps of parliament. And all this with what's going on in your personal life at the same time, kind of brought into one body yeah. of work um, uh, so effortlessly. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think the thing is, um, because often I would, like, just in terms of how I work, I'd look at things on screen, I think, 
oh my God, I just really love the way that blue fades to yellow, or, you know, to orange. Or like, so in, in, a, in a sense, each screen became like a painting. So not only did it record all those traces of human communications, it's like my, literally my daughter screaming at me, mum, would you sort of answer the text messages? And, but then it's also played into sort of idea from my, one from my mother talking about her garden suffering under the bushfires. Um, that's that close up. And then there's these interesting, I really love this particular politician when I went in, because someone in, I interviewed me previously and said, oh, um, so what politicians did you, did you um, photograph? And I actually couldn't, I said, look, really, I wasn't looking for any particular politician, I was looking for a sentiment. So the thing is, with all the images of parliament, it was, I'm really actually obsessed with work of um, Frederick Wiseman, who is a documentary filmmaker, and he used to have a, a um, he did all these amazing documentaries in um, institutional spaces, and I think um, one of the beautiful, I really love the aesthetics of the work, but um, I think in some ways it's influenced, say, the, <clears throat> the image of the politician here in the committee room. I love the way that, in a sense, he looked like a medieval, the sort of almost painterly character of his face, as well as the, the sentiment on his face. And then, and then that's played against the, um, this variance between the church and state and the politics, because, you know, they um, they come to bear, because that's actually a picture of the democracy tree, which is quite an interesting story in itself, but we probably don't have time to go into that. But um, I think in, in brief, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a, the federation tree? Yeah, the uh, federation, federation tree, oak. yeah. Um, it was a bit gnarly, so often people photograph the other oak that looks more green and uh, looks like it's flourishing. So there's this whole story about what the real oak yeah, is. Yeah, which, which is the real oak. Um, and then, um, so there's very, that's actually a shot from the hands out on the floor um, with various screens revealing themselves. And then um, I really loved this one too, is another view into the Hansard suite. And then it's that really inside, outside. And this, um, my daughter sent me a text about um, broken windows because um, her boyfriend had fallen through one of the glass windows at home. And then um, she sent to me, oh, and I said, oh, how did you go? And she said, no broken windows. But it has this beautiful narrative, even though it's like a personal incident in relation to what was going on, say, um, because this work was actually made during the storming of the capital, like, so that this sort of idea of protest, because this is one of the protesters that I took from the outside, and then a uh, picture of, like, the Hansard suite on the inside. So there's all these kind of slippages that I loved in the work, and then just even the framing around that image is like the glow from the Hansard suite. So it's sort of using photography, I love the nexus between, between, between photography as a painterly pursuit like the, and the idea of the collage of these multiple views that come to bear at one point. So um, <clears throat> that's that one close note. Thanks, getting... thanks a lot, Eliza. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, well, as we can see, both of you have been thrown into different spheres of science, politics, and mm -hmm. everything that um, uh, relates to that. Uh, Danika, can we start with you, maybe? And um, if you can kind of reveal, tell us a bit about what that actually means as, a, as an artist working with photography to have to, to be incorporating um, a whole different discipline into your work. Was it something that, was, that came seamlessly to you? Or how did you go about even thinking about that within your practice? Yeah, look, I, I really, um, I found it quite daunting to begin with uh, because, you know, I mean, science, I don't know anything about science. In fact, I've probably failed science, you know. So, um, I know scientists, but I, I'm not science-y. <laughs> so, I, I thought, oh, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to incorporate this into my, you know, into my practice? But it, it's like, well, it was just the perfect storm to be able to blend and, and bring new things in, really. And um, I guess um, to then think about, like, uh, particularly how Donna records images digitally as opposed to my analogue, 
Um, but we, you know what, I guess I was looking really for the intersections between our working processes as an initial starting point that, uh, and the first thing that, that was really obvious was that we both used dichroic film um, and lenses and we're bending light and, you know, manipulating light and really sort of putting, a, well, I'm putting my hands into the light, whereas, you know, there's this, this kind of um, manipulation of material that Donna's doing to be able to capture these really tiny, like, insanely tiny particles on a slide. So this thing of scale was also uh, apparent as a crossover. And if you were to hazard a guess, what do you think she would have taken from this collabor collaboration, working with an artist so intimately? Yeah, I think Donna, I mean, you know, I, I caught up with her on Tuesday when we finally finished the window install and, and um, she was thrilled to sort of have that, I guess, respite from science to have another way of, of thinking. And I think we, you know, we both, um, another thing that I found uh, that we both sort of um, work with this, um, the experiential nature of looking and feeling through boundaries and crossovers and, and the edges of things, I think. Um, so we, I think we both sit quite comfortably in places of not knowing stuff and figuring things out and uh, using our, our hands and our bodies to do that, I think. So, um, so she, yeah, she was wrapped. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Eliza, how about you? So your work has always merged and brought together the political and the personal, but this time around you were thrown into Victoria's sort of democratic heart. Mm. Um, what did it mean for your practice to have that kind of access to political systems and a, you know, a site, a venue of politics and democracy uh, to incorporate into your work? Um, I think the interesting thing, um it's the point to which you could basically, as it became this really dynamic process, and I think that's the thing. Cause, um, as an artist, you're normally just given free range, like to do whatever you want to do. But like in a sense, you sort of, it had an interesting scenario where there was, you know, like there's pu various amounts of pushback depending on, you know, what I'd kind of do in the various processes that I went through. And I think, um, I think that's kind of, that became a really interesting process in itself because the thing is you're always mediating, thinking, you know, analysing what you're doing and also like, you've, um, unlike classic viewers in the, in the gallery, you've got, you've got all these other people with vested interests in terms of how the work is going to be read, like which is quite an interesting thing as an artist and it sort of opens up ideas about how other people read what you're doing, like in, in a very conscious way. So I think, um, I think that was really kind of beneficial and just actually being corralled into a, having, a res, having to have a response to a very particular thing. I think, I always think it's been a really creative process because you have to, it, it sort of gives, it gives you a sort of, um, sort of parameters to work to and I think that was really useful, like for me. Um, and you mentioned the, the publicness of the work, um, which is, I believe, a uh, new departure for both of you to be presenting work both in the public realm like this, on the street, literally on the street, as well as at uh, a large scale. I mean, it's a, you know, several meters tall and wide each work. Yeah. Um, how does that make you think about the work that you're actually presenting and how you wanted to use that opportunity to operate at that urban scale? Maybe Danica, you go first. Yeah, look, um, I mean, you know, it's seven metres by four and a half metres um, and it, it's uh, inside, outside and there's a vitrine behind. So, um, you know, I was working with a little maquette in the studio that was, you know, a one to 37.5 ratio because <laughs> that's all I had to hand. And so I was building this little maquette um, <laughs> and I was like changing it and putting it up to the light and seeing if the materials would work and researching the materials and going to the sign company and getting samples and um, wondering how I could... So the, the actual material that I 
I've photogrammed onto an E6 slide, um, but I'm only using a portion of that. To, so to take that and to get a high quality scanned image was the hurdle to begin with. How am I going to actually get my images that big uh, when I don't know anything about scanning or digital? So Colour Factory really helped me out. They put, pointed me in the right direction and um, I got a, a drum scan done and um, so then it was about like carving away and letting some other elements come through and then building Donna's work into it to sort of complement and I guess bring this, I guess it's a portrait really. I mean, when you look at it, it's a bit of a Picasso type portrait. And um, so, you know, it's a bit of a, a portrait of both Donna and I in this large scale thing, but the, the way that it interacts with the dichroic. So in the morning, the sun is beaming onto this thing and the dichroics are mirrored. So they, they bounce like these beautiful light shadows onto the concrete and it really sort of brings the concrete up into this facade and, and people, you know, Kent was sort of saying, oh, I just, I just went outside and somebody's like looking at this thing on the ground and looking up and realising that the, this is where the light comes from. And this, this fascination with light is what I tend to do. I, I trace light back to its source to figure out what's creating a shadow or what's creating the light. Or um, So I guess, you know, bringing those elements in and then putting them on the street to then bring the viewer within that space and to invite them to look in, you know, and then to, for it to transition overnight. Like, it's a, quite a complex piece, really. So, yeah. Thank you. We're about to open up to the audience for questions. So if you do have some questions, just wave your hands at me. Eliza, your presentation on the steps of parliament, the material itself is printed on a, a form of very sort of like robust vinyl. There's scaffolding, there's concrete blocks, there's, there's um, a structure that holds it all together. Mm. I mean, you normally for everything I've seen have either presented work in a gallery or in book form. Um, how do you feel this has, um, uh, how, how has your practice adapted to this form of presentation? Well, it's kind of, it's interesting because I actually, when I went to art school, I originally studied sculpture. So I had that, I've always really as, um, had that drive towards that medium. So the thing is, and I've always had a fascination about the, the nexus between photography and sculpture because when I was doing, studying sculpture and I wanted to do photography as my comp prac, everyone would say, that, they're like, at, this is, you know, in the 90s, they'd say, oh, but sculpture and photography, why would you want to do that combination? Because it wasn't really offered to sculptors at the time. So I think the thing is, it's, um, it's a really great opportunity. It's so sort of concrete an opportunity to have to have display work outside. And because my husband works in public art, so I, he, his work always has this longevity out, you know, beyond the, just like a gallery show. And I kind of... And I sort of thought, oh, you know, it'd be really great. And he always really encouraged me to apply to do a public piece. And, and I think so that marrying of that sort of interest in sculpture and photography and what the possibilities of their combination could be. Like in, and I, I've, done, I've explored that in a, sort of some earlier pieces where I've used kind of slashed up images and created photography. Um, sculptures from them but um, this was really another realm so it really and I was really wanting to explore the notion of display and how you can the display because obviously there could be images involved and how that display became meaningful as well as sculptural so and I was really happy with it in the end because I thought um, it has the gravitas and it kind of really has to deal with that building because you there's such a strong relationship um, with the building, the way the form was um, evolved, and also just the, all the structures of the building, sort of, and how they relate to the images, because, you know, there's images of columns in and out through the work, so it has that sort of tie back to the building. Yeah, it's a very nuanced, rich yeah. project that takes, uh, that really rewards viewing. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? We do. Okay, just, let's just get the microphone to you. Just to expand on the installation, um, the construction with the scaffolding and the concrete structures, are you telling any story with that installation? Uh, yeah, it is, because um, in, in a sense, um, 
as I said earlier, you know, it, is, it mirrors that form of the end of Parliament, the Australian par Parliament, where the two sides are coming, you know, like where it's more collegiate, and the two sides are coming together in a more cohesive form. So, and because I was just playing with the inside and the outside, and also, also the fracturing of the narrative, because, it, because the way that curve works, you know, instead of seeing the images butted up against each other, it's much more fractured, like you, I mean, each, and it gives each one space as well, because the thing is, if you have them all together, it's almost too much. But because you've got that space that, of the curve, it sort of allows them to breathe between. So, and also the monumental nature of the concrete box. It ha I mean, which was like, you know, it's great in one way, because there's such huge wind loadings up there, so you had to have really something substantial to, to sort of locate them. And also, I didn't want to... Um, design a structure that would just become a big waste of money. I wanted to use found, like found objects that could be assembled and disassembled and it wasn't going to cost a lot of money and it was going to be, um, but really do the job. But so we designed it very carefully up beforehand and, it, and actually when it came up on the steps, I thought, oh, I can't believe it works <laughs> because it's the first time I'd seen it up and, you know, it all kind of came, it seemed to sort of work with the building because it's such a big building to sort of set something up again, so... I think that um, that approach to the, the scale, like you can't believe it worked. Like when I first saw the work at uh, La Trobe on the facade, I was like, oh my God, it's actually taking shape as I yeah. imagined it to take shape in the maquette. So it's uh, true, quite an it? overwhelming sensation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, unless there's any final burning questions, we are running out of time. I didn't see any hands, so... I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, I urge you all to go and see Eliza's work. I wanted you to know outside the Parliament of Victoria, it's on view 24 seven <laughs> until uh, the 7th of March. And do make it up to Bendigo to see uh, Far From the Eye, Danica Chapel's stunning exhibition and facade at the La Trobe Art Institute. Open during gallery hours, hours, but as we can see, also a treat after dark. So Absolute treat after dark. So go and stay the night. Um, that just leaves me to, first of all, say join us here in 15 minutes as we have uh, Phoebe Powell and Kate Dishaquil talk about the incredible project working with um, healthcare workers on the front line of the fight against COVID here in Victoria. But in the meantime, please join me in a big round of applause to thank Eliza Hutchison and Danica Chapel. Thank you so much. Thank you.